Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for your patience. Um, and I'll, I'll get started. I'll try not to be too boring at first, but I'm going to explain the Deleuzian concept of the fold and how I came to it. For this presentation, I reflected primarily on an article by Gilles Deleuze called The Fold, a version translated from French to English in 1991. It is available online. I came upon this text via the artist Roland Flexner, who focused on this concept of the fold as developed by Deleuze while he was making his mourner figures, drawings of monks completely covered in drapery, whose bodies and even faces were closed off to the outside with immense interiority. These were really big paintings, so I think this is a composite of three paintings. Um, their hoods cover their faces and they are silent. I also read Deleuze's article against the backdrop of the group exhibition Poor and the idea of abstract painting. Deleuze's motif of the fold is evocative of the modes of representation possible in abstract painting. Okay. It's not happy. slow. All right, well, I'll just keep on going. So that was just a picture of the Warner figures before. Um, and I was talking about the group exhibition, The Poor. Uh, in that exhibition, there was a lot of abstract painting that had to do with pouring paint. About Roland Flexner's process. It really helps if I have the images that go with it. Let's see. Yeah. It's not connecting. Could you slide? Three. Now, maybe I'll just do this. There, there we go. All right, so this is an installation view of the exhibition at FAU called The Poor. Um, and then, there we go. This is an image of one of Roland Flexner pieces called Untitled. It's really small in actuality. It's projected much larger than it is. And it's, um, it's made from liquid graphite. You Flexner wets a piece of paper in one tray, and then in the next tray, he dips it in a bath of liquid graphite. And in the next tray, he dips it again in, in water. And then he blows or presses or variously manipulates the paper in order to achieve these landscape-like effects. And each one of them is immensely different as much as the landscape itself is, but they're really small and they're made in the space of a moment. Um, so Flexner made these pieces after thinking about Deleuze's work for really 20 years. So um, they're relevant to the discussion at hand. Um, in Deleuze's case, he deploys imagery as a sort of performance of undulation, of breathing, and of creating concept actions consistent with his reading of Leibniz, that a philosopher is a creator of concepts, and that those concepts can be appropriated from a flow, the flow of all the thoughts, not concepts, that everybody has. Lane Relier wrote an essay about virtuality in painting, and this along with a general reflection on how virtuality has infused my own mode of reading, thinking, and, re and writing in a continuing negotiation between exteriority and interiority, authorship and readership, artist and viewer. 
It is this meditation on virtuality and modes of working that I include screenshots in my presentation of juxtaposed sources from my research in the slideshow. So what you see is on the top left an excerpt from Deleuze's The Fold. On the bottom left an excerpt from a lecture by Deleuze on Leibniz. And on the right a picture of Marie Teresa in ecstasy in a church in Rome. It's a sculpture that's well known by Bernini and an example of Baroque sculpture. So it will become important. Deleuze treats Leibniz's monad as a jumping off point for several examples. Now, to back up, the monad was Leibniz's term for the smallest possible indivisible bit of matter. Purely theoretical, of course. The Leibnizian monad was a container for the soul. It had cellular, even atomic aspects before anyone knew what these were. It was the autonomy of the interior. Deleuze's interest in the monad was in the way Leibniz described it. Undulating folds of drapery. Imagine the dynamic, even wild drapery of Baroque sculpture. For Deleuze, the undulation itself was a powerful metaphor. The monad was a space to capture the soul with no way in and no way out. Deleuze observes that the way Leibniz describes the monad can be understood through the rhetorical mind image of the Baroque church. The church ha has a facade through which one passes from the outside to the inside where there is a base level where people sit and the clergy perform rituals and the energy and light is all directed upwards into the clerestory where the light source is disguised and one is meant to contemplate the decoration, the awesome heights enhanced by that decoration. The base level is still grounded with the elements of the outside, which can still get in. Deleuze writes, Baroque architecture can be defined by the schism of the facade and the inside, of the interior and the exterior, the autonomy of the interior and the independence of the exterior, affected in such a way that each one sets off the other. So here's a view of a church in Vienna. Often decoration is comprised of various folding shapes which can comfortably fit a soul or to say it less ecumenically can induce a transcendent experience in which one forgets one's own body. It is the upper story which is closed a pure interior without exterior, an interiority sealed in weightlessness, lined in spontaneous folds which are now only those of the soul or spirit. From a single viewpoint from below, the clerestory seems a jewel box in which the absolute resides. In this sense, we see this idea explored later in Deleuze's essay. There are two utterly important vectors in the Baroque world, a sinking downward and an upward pull. Collapse and recoil. Coil is another way of translating the French noun pli, which appears in the French version of the essay, The Fold. Again, refer to the architectural model and imagine the motion of attention inside it. What Leibniz would have called souls, we might call out-of-body attention, utter absorption in something outside ourselves in our physical space. This is, I think, a pitfall of thinking about the interiority of thought. Okay, so that makes me skip ahead. So in here, come on. This is a deet, this is a image of a picture by El Greco called The Burial of Count Orgaz, and Deleuze cites it specifically in this essay that he wrote. Um, in it, he says that there's two zones, or at least three, that are implied. There's the burial, so there's the zone underneath. There's the middle zone that we see clearly. It's very horizontal with the line of heads. 
um, that's that's our realm. You know, that's what we are. And then there's this undulating curve up into the heavens, and and that's the upward pull. Um, and then there's this detail of this guy. He's got his face in rapt attention upwards. His attention, his his everything that's in his being isn't really thinking about where he is at that moment. He's thinking about what's up there. So then, we have this guy. The musician in the middle. This is an installation view of Werner Herzog's installation at the Whitney Biennial in 2012. He installed a a multi-screen view of Sagers, who's a Baroque, for lack of a better term, a Baroque Dutch artist who was a landscape painter, but he was a landscape painter of no landscape that we've ever seen. It looks different than most landscapes that a Dutch person would see. Um, And he claims that this painter is the first painter of modernity. In that, we have here some real abstraction. And he also centers that abstraction around different views of this musician playing attractive music where he starts pianissimo, really quietly, and then he comes into a climax where at this point he's in utter ecstasy, a lot like Marie Teresa in ecstasy, the Bernini sculpture I showed you before. Okay. It would be a mistake to forget that Baroque architecture has as much or more to do with power and politics of the time than pure spirituality, quote unquote. Nevertheless, we are left with the problem of the efficacy of the strategy of lifting the soul and thereby staging a seduction of the person t- attached to it. In turn, we also continue to face the problem of the dialectic of the inside and outside and how to disturb effectively the tropes of representing that divide, or at least to be conscious of how that divide exists now for the particular artist or on a more macro-cultural level. I will talk about interiority and exteriority, the appearance of fold motif as evident in the images and in all it's quite different origins and manifestations. I'm exploring how in our times virtual space is the pro- predominant one for abstract thought, even ecstatic thought, as the brick and mortar achieved a physical space for it then. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. One of the painters I know well, Elizabeth Condon, exhibited a show at called The Seven Seas at Art and Culture Center of Hollywood last year. For the show, she tapped her memories of the club scene of the early 1970s. Think teenage girls. Elizabeth was one of them. And glam rock and their various activities in the collision of the two. She did supplemental research into the time as well. Her bibliography includes Pamela de Barnes' I'm with the Band, Confessions of a Groupie, David Burns' How Music Works, as well as watching film and listening to the music, seeking to re-immerse herself in the mindset. Her preparation seemed a lot like that of a method actor, and her painting practice was when she was on stage performing, though in the traditional fashion of a painter. That action was private, while the finished painting was the public part. There is a nostalgia to these pieces, but it is tinged with browns and blacks that push at the shiny colors. These are post-expressionistic pieces, not least because of the way Condon deploys the poor to distance herself from the mark, but also because of the (coughs) acute awareness with which these paintings are composed. The poor has little to no accident in it. The energy implied is carefully reconstructed using stains, the symbolism and literal effects of glitter, 
the sketchiness of her drawn lines. They waver between abstraction and in a somewhat romantic portrayal of interiority. She writes this as recollection and fades into a song quote. You shut your eyes and start to move. There's no overarching framework like religion or aesthetics or freedom. It's simpler, more immediate, what you always wanted, staring through the wallpaper patterns in your bedroom as music poured down around you. The barrier of longing dissolves under light and the volume of shared sound. Reflections of people's faces, dancing bodies, the LP covers on Rodney's brick wall, cigarette smoke revealing gritty matte black drywall, fragment and glitter from the bank of mirrors as if speeding into a new sunrise. The critique of this kind of practice is that it does not recognize that there is no possibility for expression, except the really embarrassing kind. That is, if you subscribe wholesale to Hal Foster's expressive fallacy, in which he states that neo-expressionist expressionist painting and even historical abstract expressionist painting was always already in representational. It was just that the language that was used to represent and what it represented was incredibly varied. Rather than the received impression being wholly subjective, the associations are guided by the artist and the venue in various ways. There is usually a story that accompanies the piece. I would contend that Elizabeth is perfectly conscious of the tropes of painting and has decided that operating within its bounds is her calling. Other artists push at the parameter of painting and abstraction in different ways. Okay. This is an installation view by Victoria Fu. It's done this year. It's called Lorem Epsom. In it, they're, they're, they're videos, they're, so they're moving images. And she constructs a narrative through the rapid or somewhat rapid compilation of different moving windows that show different parts of the body. So a, a feet running down a stairs and the window goes running down the stairs. Um, a head going towards a door and you hear the door opening. Um, so this person is literally running around a house, but you're constructing it from the little parts that she's giving you and in what seems to be little windows on a virtual screen. This artist, Sebron Verstig, uh, he creates these paintings by coding them. He actually writes what's called Boolean code, if-then statements, um, to create these images, and he's done it enough so that he sort of knows what he's doing even when he's in the process of writing the code. So he's looking at the code and he knows what the image is that's going to come out. Um, and he can just print them and then he stretches them on stretcher bars and puts them up. It's sort of appallingly easy. Um, he, But yet there's still this extreme consternation in the switch between the virtual and the real. The, 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 the code and the image and the image and the physical object. So all of those different steps cause great wonder and also a certain amount of confusion. He's still figuring it out. <laughs> this is a piece by April Street and here I'm gonna start playing a little bit. Um, in her work, she lets it, known, lets it be known in the press release that she actually lies on these pieces of fabric while she's sleeping uh, and washes it off and then paints it again. She lets the palette be somewhat skin-like and muddied. Um, and she lets them drape with a certain acknowledgement of the force of gravity on the fabric, which somehow makes it more vulnerable. 
And then what I do here is I start to, again, play. I'm juxtaposing a scene of April's piece with a screenshot of, in one case, a Felix Gonzalez Torres piece, and in another case, a installation view in a home of a Morris Lewis painting. So I'm now switching over into a expression of my own interiority and how virtuality has affected the way I can imagine painting. So in any moment when I'm looking at something, this is the closest approximation to what I can tell you that I see. <laughs> so um, I love that April's sort of new generation paintings with a certain feminism to them might be able to supersede Morris Lewis in this beautiful house. <laughs> um, this is another person that uses a sort of play to play with Morris Lewis. I had to put it in there. This is a new piece by Frances Trombley. Um, she takes her, she takes a partially woven sheet of fabric off the loom and leaves the ties from the end of where it's attached to the loom there. So what you see that's draped at the bottom is just what's not been finished. Um, this, the yellow part is part of the fabric also, it's twine. So, and then here you have a juxtaposition of Francis, a detail of Francis's work with a Proust, an image of Pr Marcel Proust's manuscripts. Proust is known for um, a series of novels in which he painstakingly describes every single detail of remembered life. Specifically, this piece comes from In Remembrance of Things Past. And on the bottom left, there's an excerpt from a Benjamin essay reflecting on Marcel Proust's manuscripts, in which he says, For the experienced event is finite, at any rate, confined to one sphere of experience. A remembered event is infinite, because it is only a key to everything that happened before it and after it. So there's an often told story of a Madeleine cookie in the Mar Marcel Proust's novel in which he dips a cookie and vividly remembers impo an impossible detail, a pa something that happened to him in the past. Um, and it's, it's often told, but that's what he meant when there's this, there's this infinite opening up in memory that can be, you know, sort of fudged and elaborated. Um, whereas the experienced event has the limitation of time passing. So then I'll just go through a few more abstract paintings that I'm just looking at. Matt Rich with details. These pieces are laid completely flat to the wall. They're two dimensional. They're just paper that have been painted over and over and over again and collaged. And then, you know, he, he sort of figures out the right composition and puts them in two dimensions onto the wall. This is a piece by Dave Hardy, which I know it's not a painting, but it is wall oriented and it does deal with the fold. So again, I'm playing. The language that Deleuze uses in the essay is part of the reason why I've become sort of obsessed with it. So just take a moment to read this quote. You guys can't read it.
Okay. So with that really <laughs> evocative language, uh, speaking of um, subterranean folds um, into microscopic folds, you can start to really see how the imagination can run wild. And again, this is just an excerpt of a previous lecture that I did where I was riffing on that sort of imagination. So associating Flexner with a screenshot of a canyon where I've been. So I looked it up. And a screenshot of Flexner and Corbet, which to me, like the Sager to Herzog, to me this, this image of Corbet is the beginning of modernity for me because I can't think of any other time than looking at the sea where you lapse into a metaphysical thinking. So I'll just go quickly through these. Again, free association. Almost done. That's it. Go back. Here. You want me to go back? Go back one. Go back one. This one. You see the gazer. The gazer again. In the reflection of this piece by Kari Yamaoka, which is it has a highly reflective sur surface. Okay. So. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> I just have that abstract landscape. The Dutch guy. I'm uh -huh. oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. To you. I also just ask that you just speak quite loudly. If you speak can. loudly so everyone can hear. Okay. <laughs> no. I just wanted to ask that Dutch painter that you had in the original things uh -huh. you were showing, who did abstract. What was his name? Well, they're technically landscapes. Yes. Um, his name is is Seger. S E G E R. I'm probably not saying it right. No, it's okay. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm wondering if you could unpack a little bit the term um, interiority. Ah, okay. When you think about the interior of something, we are all inside this space together. Um, when I am by myself and writing, I would consider myself inside my head. And usually since now I'm writing on the screen and on the computer, there's a mix of myself being inside my head and with my attention directed on my computer. The only time I'm really inside my head is if I'm in a to totally dark room and, you know, really thinking about myself and I can't do that for long. Um, I don't know many people that can. So the, the aspects of interior, interiority or exteriority in that dialectic is sort of a problem when you start to get down to thinking about, okay, where is my attention right now or where, where, where am I inside? And when you start to really try and articulate what that is, it becomes difficult and that's interesting. Um, and that's part of why abstraction um, is, is interesting because there's this fluctuation between what the artist might intend or give to you in terms of what he can, he can attract your attention with and what you bring to it. So there's this, sometimes this meeting of interiority and exteriority. Okay. <coughs> Arthur. Yes. Yeah. It's a coil. Yeah. Yeah. 
I know. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. The um, the only time I can think of actual ecstasy is right here in this in this one, and then um, in some of Elizabeth's paintings. It's just that the problem with those depictions of ecstasy is that they fall into a trope of that ecstasy, sort of. The Herzog one is pretty interesting, you have to admit. Um, so it's, but it's also a problem with contemporary contemporary times. Maybe we are too gravity laden. Maybe we need a little more upward movement. I I don't know. I'd be interested. Does anybody have any examples or, or of less spiritual? I mean, that's what you, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the 21st century, the spirituality of that. I think maybe we're all maybe weighted down different. by yeah. a lack of spirituality. I don't know. I can't. Yeah. I can speak for yeah. myself. Yeah. I think it there's a flow. Well, yeah, there's a there's an inside we, outside we, movement. That's the whole solution concept is about how we arrive at being unique by creating stuff, by experiencing our cultural heritage or whatever. It's about outside in. Fold is all about folding in. It has nothing to do with going in up. It's got about outside in. So outside of like the yeah, so like I think it's that's, that's, that's the fold. The fold has nothing to do with spirituality. It has not, it's, 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 it's that you're, 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 you're missing the point. And the, the whole idea of a Baroque architecture has to do with, like, like keep that picture there. Go back to the attic. This that one? Floor. Yeah. See, that the bottom floor is a public space. The top floor represents the private space. The private space is our subjectivity. So, like, and, and the space in between is, 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 is how we create unique uniqueness. How things work from inside up and upside down. That's the whole idea of the world. It's, it's, uh, it's nothing that, because the loose comes from sort of a, that sort of, that sort of like, archaeological, like, French, blah, 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 blah like, uh, <coughs> thing that's all about outside in, never about inside out. It's, it's, it's English. Okay, no, it's good. The but the one thing that I would say is that it's not always about out outside in. That is, that is the loop. That's the loop. That's yeah, but it's sometimes he's seeing that there's a creation that happens of a concept, and he's performing that concept. I think that the inside out doesn't necessarily the the fold just is. No, the fold is about folding. Okay. All right. Well, all I was doing was trying to see a motif within it. It's not ready yet. And then, okay. Tell me when it's ready. Um, <laughs> but interiority is subjectivity. That's the same thing. That's the same I, I appreciate what you're saying. I think that this is an attempt at reading Deleuze. And it's also a reading it against painting. And in the process of reading, one can feel free to misinterpret it. <laughs> um, and many, many people have. Uh, it, is, it is one's right as a reader. So um, part of this is showing the ecstatic experience of reading. So, I mean, if I was wrong in some of my readings of Deleuze, I want to learn about that. You but know, is that not but kind it's kind of like the contemporary way to research. Like the screenshots are points of what you see, and then you make what it is that's most convenient for you. Mm -hmm. 
what would be a better so what, if, what <coughs> is basically what is the immediacy? Okay. I was just making a note that convenience is the wrong way to that up. Because it's seemingly, um, lately everything that's been done uh, in art is, in my uh, reading, all based on convenience. Well, what? Based Convenient on conveniences. Convenience. So, conveniences. Conveniences meaning like lazy technical skill or convenience in what terms? Uh, not lazy technical skill, but uh, things that are presented at hand, which are basically chosen, um, which whose choice is dictated by um, sort of um, very interior subjective uh, like, qualities, like without dialogue. necessarily taking into consideration the you know. Okay. One is being in the world as opposed to one is just an island. Like a diary entry versus yeah, like for, a yeah, yeah. snapshot of the world or something. Yes. Okay. okay, so to be clear, when I was looking up these images in Google, I was looking up specific images. Right. So I knew already that this image would depict what I was looking for. I have a degree in art history I knew what it was and the other thing about it is that when I'm thinking about a painting or something I'm thinking about these specific citations that isn't it amazing that I can see them all together in one place yes, while I'm <laughs> while I'm while I'm um, thinking about the painting um, and then the other thing is there's this there's this other concept called the death of the author, where I can read something and misinterpret it or take my own path from it. And in that moment, I can think about the fold as something that I've experienced. So in my case, I have some sort of Childlike experiences Absolutely. with the fold, and in that sense, along with the author, yeah, the both. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want the no, author the to the author cease being. I would also sure. want to continue being a reader. No, absolutely. I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that yeah. new kind of author emerges. So, along with the author. Okay. Yeah. I also wanted to touch on, and obviously there's a challenge because there are so many, so yeah. I encourage anyone to try to get as close as I can. And we're going to try the microphone, and if it's weird, we'll stop. But, okay. Um, but also, I wanted to pose a question at you. Um, with Seabird and the painting that we were touching on a little bit, and the, uh -huh. also the idea of Elizabeth pouring um, the painting and looking at like Morris Lewis and artists like that, I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to it. Maybe we can open up the discussion a little bit more about um, automatic painting or automatism, or whatever we might call that, and so those kinds of choices, the automatic choices, like writing the code and seeing what it looks like, um, versus sort of deliberate mark making, and if that is an interesting, we'll see if that's interesting. Okay. So if you're using the word automatic uh -huh. to describe pouring, uh, any gestures that are not necessarily a deliberate a, a gesture that maybe that's not, that's not chosen. So right. So, so letting the so pouring paint on the paper. canvas like more so than letting the shape of the pour turn itself, um, and letting these kinds of automatic things kick in where you don't necessarily make the choice to, to have it look a certain way, but you're you're like the Elizabeth, like the piece of Elizabeth's where she's just sort of slashing the paint across and not really. It's well, not, it's a different kind of mark making. I just, I'm just curious if we can maybe get it's to maybe it's intuitive. It. It's an it's an intuitive way of working as opposed to a deliberate way or an automatic way. It's, but it's, it's somewhat deliberate. Intuitive. It's deliberate, and then you're deliberately deciding to pour instead of mark. Right. So yeah. I would say they're both deliberate, but I would say that there's something distinctly different about allowing the, an engaging an automatic mark. Does anyone have anything on that? Well. <laughs> The one thing I would say is that often when that choice is made, there's a there's a, a desire for a distancing from the expressionistic index. Express 
expressionistic index. Okay, please unpack that. Okay, <laughs> so when you have the brush mark, um, you have the implied action of that mark, and it's sort of performative. Is it on? No. Okay, there we go. Okay, so expressive index. Um, that has to do with, I'm trying to think of somebody that would be right. Expressive index. Min. 1900s abstraction. Um, think about, I don't know, uh, Joni Mitchell. Uh, that, that gesture. You can just sort of imagine somebody making that gesture while they're making the piece. Um, and that gesture is then equated with some sort of direct line between what you see on the paper or the picture plane and the person's emotional state of being, which is sort of ludicrous, if you think about it. I'm sorry, um, I, sort of, I sort of missed that one. Okay. Yeah, just maybe a little bit. A little bit. All right. Um, a gestural mark. Okay. It is not a direct line, a, like a phone call or a oh. messaging system between the picture and the artist's state of mind. Oh. So the fallacy is that it is. The concept that it is is, is maybe misfounded. A romantic You're not concept. <laughs> he doesn't want any more. Um, so the, the poor or any sort of automatism of a mark is disrupting that, that instinct. That instinct to equate gesture with any sort of connection to the artist as a emotive right. person. Um, and, and it's seeking to make it about something different. Um, but it's different in every painting. That's actually really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the, what that other thing is, if it's not emotive, mm -hmm. what then is automatic? What is that choice to go auto? To go auto. To go automatic, to not be emotive. Well, I would say that Elizabeth is still trying to evoke some sort of a mood or an emotion because she's she's trying to be she's trying to evoke a time before in the early 1970s in LA. Um, but with Sebrin, it's a lot harder to pinpoint what exactly he's doing. It's more it's far more removed. It's far more I don't know. It's an, he, he's almost creating an image of abstract painting, but it's, it's just an image. And it's still a unique image, that's what's difficult about it, but it's, it's just an image, and what do we take from it when it's not connected to paint? But it changes everything when he, when he knows what the outcome is, as yeah. he's doing. Yeah, it's then amazing. He, then the magic starts. Mm -hmm. You can also read into that as like, he's creating the machine that's expressing something. So it's like a machine of feelings. You made a machine of feelings right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's essentially the. I think it's essentially the same thing. It's just a different, a different. It's a different set of removes. I'm sorry. I would grab that there. Sure, sure. What is the process that he uses to create? He he uses coding. He uses he codes on the computer um, a, with Boolean statements, if then statements. Um, that then create these images in their sum. So it's pages and pages and pages of code that create these images. And he's able to, in the raw code, figure out what things <coughs> might change in the final image. So uh, it's easy to see how that change might happen if you change the color of something, for instance. But I, I, I can't it sort of blows my mind thinking about how we can conceive of the shapes or, or the different layerings and, and how that looks. But he's been doing it for a few years now, so he says that he can. It has a layer of leading to historical abstraction. Like yes, it's absolutely. It's all text. Mm -hmm. It's all text and then it's revealed in a visual way. Uh, yeah. Well, the whole whole digital world is based on that. 
Yeah. Like half of, half of art nowadays is basically based on on code. But just on the on the, on the re reverse. Mm -hmm. You can take a, a digital picture and, and just write. It can be coded into just zeros and ones. Yes. It's still the same picture. And it just so happens that Leibniz invented the bi binary code. Oh. Weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to go back to coding. Uh huh. Something that I'm very interested in. Yes, I know. Uh, uh, the Lumos, uh, because the outside in. Uh huh. Because we grow with cultural constraints, mm -hmm. and our parents almost put all of the data for us to understand the world somehow, and. Um, there's a section in which he uses the concept of origami, which is also something that I like very much. And it's interesting that by using a paper that has the same quality in both sides, it can give you also an understanding of how a shape, for instance, has to be done by folding from outside in but then you have to reverse the process and open the paper so that the strength of the paper by going inverse makes the shape much stronger. So uh, I guess somehow what you're touching in terms of you seeing inside out is, is literally from outside in, inside out, and, and goes back and forth. So. Um, and also, for instance, there's a quite interesting person uh, living right now. He, uh, his name is John, John Salas, and he folds um, napkins the way the royalty used to centuries ago. And so he, he, in, in this book, I found interesting answers to the loose's uh, theory, because he says that by folding, first preparing the fabric and then folding it from outside in, uh -huh. then the guests or, or the people around the table, they will start opening from outside in. And they will find that inside is where they can clean themselves and then fold it to present it to the rest as a clean, uh, you know, you don't show all the messiness, you fold it and show it to the rest, like it's very clean. So, uh, uh, the loose uses analogies in, in that sense that when you fold, you cover, you layer yes. stuff, no? You, you can <laughs> fold, you can create energy, you can collapse time or expand time. Waves are like the waves in water or the waves in, in the <coughs> earth. And the last one thing is uh, with Sebring, uh, one of the things that I, uh, I find in his work is that besides creating coding, the coding comes after selecting the gesture. Mm. He selects first the gesture, the brush mark. Yeah. And then that brush, brush mark is a, has a pre-code. Yeah. He's not coding. He's not calling like, wrong. You know, like crazy, yeah. not knowing. No, no. He knows that this brush mark has this code. Uh -huh. And so whatever you see there, the colors, the brush strokes, the spaces in between, have been pre-selected. Therefore, it's this complete choice. So it's sort of like a collage in a way. And, and, a and coded and, collage. And, and one more thing is that yeah. he brings tons of them. I know. And then he edits. He mm -hmm. gets exactly what he likes the most. That's it's what not like Roland he accepts does technology too. the way it is. And, and, and maybe there's some kind of like a mistake in the coding and, and he puts that out because it's acceptance so of the aesthetic process within the, the mathematical uh, technology. No, on the contrary, he's using it to his best because he's at post editing and mm -hmm. getting the best out of it. Yeah. 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 Good. Thank you.
This is great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, thank you very much. And I'll stay for a little longer if you want to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks.